Hi everyone! I hope you've had a great week so far and I hope you're ready for another video on this human biology course. Today, we are going to talk about the stuff that allows us to be here and the stuff that gives us most of our traits, the good and the bad, unfortunately. That stuff, as you might have guessed, is DNA. So let's start from the beginning. You know by now that most cells have got a nucleus with chromosomes inside of it. I will explain at a later stage why I said most cells and not all cells. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes inside each cell. Within each pair, one of the chromosomes came from your mother and the other came from your father. And these are called homologous chromosomes. 22 of these pairs are called autosomal chromosomes and the last pair are the sex chromosomes, so your Y and X chromosomes which determine what gender you're born as. Each chromosome is made up of extremely dense chains of DNA. In the DNA you have segments called genes, which code for specific proteins, which then act on the body when they're produced and give you those traits that I've mentioned before. So that's the overview of the DNA and where it is located. So now let's get specific. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and it is shaped as a double helix. A double helix is basically two strands which run in opposite ways and which are complementary. In a previous video, I mentioned that DNA is made up of four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine. These bases group together in pairs, so adenine binds to thymine and guanine binds to cytosine. That is their only combination. So when we say that two strands are complementary, it means that if one of the strands has an adenine base in a specific location, the other strand will have a thymine base in its corresponding location. These bases bind through hydrogen bonds. The DNA is made up of nucleotides. These, in turn, are made up of a sugar, called deoxyribose, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base, adenine, thymine, cytosine or guanine. The sugar of one nucleotide binds to the phosphate group of the next nucleotide, and so on. This is called the sugar phosphate backbone, as it is due to the bond between the sugar and the phosphate that DNA manages to maintain its structure. So your existence, and mine, and everyone you know, is only possible because of the genetic material that is encoded in this molecule. As mentioned before, specific segments of the DNA chain are called genes, because the sequence of bases in those segments are actually a code. This code is then decoded in a process called protein synthesis. This is something we will talk about in detail soon, but for now, all you need to know is that a lot of molecules and structures are involved in this process, and the final result is a protein. This protein is then used wherever it is needed, and this gives rise to a phenotype. Phenotype is just a fancy way of saying a trait that you can observe, so hair color, eye color, height, etc. Going back to those genes, the word gene refers to the sequence of bases which encodes for a protein. This sequence is present in the same place on each chromosome. The location of a gene in the DNA is called a locus, or loci in plural. The best way to think about this is by thinking about parking your car in a car park. Each space in that car park has a name or number, so you can remember its location, for example, B12. In this context, that space you parked your car in is the equivalent of a locus, and your car is the equivalent of a gene. So your car is in that specific place called B12, whilst all the other cars have their own specific locations. It is the same as a certain gene which is located in a locus, and all the other genes have their own loci. The difference is that at the end of the day, you get in your car and drive off, whilst our genes are always in the same place. For each gene, you have alleles. 
These are the different variations which occur for that gene. So if you think about the gene for eye color, the alleles would be blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes, black eyes, etc. Usually, there is more than one gene involved in traits like eye color, but to simplify things, let's think about it as being one gene. Now let's talk about another molecule, called RNA. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. This molecule is very similar to DNA in most ways, but there are a few differences. The first difference is that RNA has a single strand, whilst DNA is a double helix. The second difference is their backbone. The backbone of DNA is made of deoxyribose sugar and phosphate. With RNA, the backbone is made of ribose sugar and phosphate. The third and last difference is one of the bases. In DNA, adenine pairs with thymine. However, in RNA, adenine pairs with uracil, which is a different form of thymine. So what does one have to do with the other, and why are there so many similarities between these two molecules? That is because they are linked to each other. Do you remember that protein synthesis process I mentioned earlier? This is where RNA comes in. RNA is a copy of part of one of the DNA strands. During this protein synthesis process, the two DNA strands are temporarily separated. When this happens, special enzymes appear and they use freestanding bases and sugars and other molecules to produce this RNA strand, using one of the DNA strands as a template. So basically, this RNA strand that is formed is complementary to that DNA strand, except when it is formed, uracil is used instead of thymine, and ribose is used instead of deoxyribose. These two molecules, RNA and DNA, are the nucleic acids. These are the fourth and last macronutrient. If you remember, we talked about the carbohydrates, proteins and lipids in our first video, and we mentioned that the fourth macronutrient were nucleic acids. Our final subject for today is the replication of DNA. When you are forming new cells, the DNA needs to replicate, so the new cell has DNA as well. This replication process is semi-conservative, and this is because when this replication occurs, the two strands of DNA are separated and then used as templates for the new strands. So each new DNA molecule formed will have one strand from the original DNA molecule and one completely new strand made up of freestanding building blocks present in the nucleus. If you look at the next diagram, it will become a bit clearer what semi-conservative replication means. In order for this to happen, two very important enzymes are involved. Helicase is the enzyme responsible for separating the two DNA strands, so that new strands can be formed. DNA polymerase is the enzyme which forms the new strands by binding the freestanding building blocks to the template strand of DNA. And that is it for today. I hope you have enjoyed learning about the bases of all life. I hope to see you again next week for the ninth video of the Human Biology course. See you then!